first of all, he was well liked by everybody. And he's a three sport athlete. Played two years of varsity basketball. Uh, he and I met because we were both new to the football team our senior year. You know what's great about Tommy? He is who he is. Doesn't worry about being cool. Uh, doesn't, um, you know, he's his own man and has always been. Tom and I have known each other since we're freshmen in high school, 13, 14 years old. And uh, we're, we have a whole lot of memories, but I think the, probably the, the biggest one I would remember would do is he would love to debate the teachers. So Tom is one who does like to talk, but he actually sharpened his debating skills in those classes, um, especially with his history teacher, uh, Irv Grant, who was, I believe, at the time going to law school and probably was getting about four hours of sleep and wasn't real uh, open to a lot of debate, but he got it from Tom. We all live in the same area in Danville, Tassara Valley, at least years ago. And it very much was in its infancy. And Tom was one who was very active in the community, much like he was active in the community here at De La Salle. And when there was buildings that needed to be built, he was there. When there was coaching jobs that needed to be done, he was there. He took that on also to St. Isidore's. And at St. Isidore's, he and Brenda were ahead of the of the Parent Association, uh, very much behind the scenes on doubling of the school. He then brought all of that energy and direction here at De La Salle when his boys were here. So he, very instrumental, but very much behind the scenes many times. Wasn't always the tip of the spear, name wasn't there, wasn't there for name recognition. He was there to get it done. When he came to De La Salle, you have to understand that De La Salle, in the time he was here, there were some 20 plus Christian brothers in the community. And besides his parents, they shaped Tom, his character development, his spirituality, his real social commitment. And with that, he then took that on and it just became part of his DNA. And I think probably the biggest thing about Tom is that he doesn't want the recognition. That's not important to him. In fact, he's probably squirming in his chair as we speak. But he just wanted to get it done, and, he, and that has really been something Tom has, has taken through his whole life and been, been consistent. De La Salle just happens to be part of it. It's much more than that. Ken is the entrepreneur, and we were sitting around, he was on the Board of Trustees at the time, and we were talking about building a new administration building. And of course, naturally, you, uh, the bottom line is always the big question as to whether or not you're going to go ahead with any kind of project. So Ken looked around the room, and he kind of smiled, and he said, well, you know, how much money do you need? And we told him, it was quite a bit, and he said, well, you know, I think we got enough money right in this room to, to build this building. And of course, people kind of squirmed and smiled along with him. And he says, you know, if you need that much money, I think I can help you. And he named a certain price, which was uh, quite generous of him. He said, if, but I'll tell you, it has to be named after Brother Jerome West. And so we said, well, you know, we can do that, uh, Ken. We'll be happy to do that. And of course, the building now exists, the Brother Jerome West Hall, thanks to Ken's prodding and his own very generous donation. And he was a man who you could turn to because you knew we would get things done with Ken Hoffman at the helm, or at least in the background. And as I say, he was also very unpretentious. I mean, you, you try, well, gee, Ken, we'd like to name this building. No, oh, no, no, no. It's going to be Brother Jerome, or it's going to be so and so. Or he was always very. I'm, I'm surprised that De La Salle was able to uh, get his name on a building. I think they had to probably get on their knees and pray that Ken, Ken would, would 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 agree, and he finally did. But it was, I'm sure, he, his unpretentiousness and generosity were always at the forefront of his thinking, beside getting things done. And uh, for athletics, for Catholic education. He really is a, um, a star. After I uh, finished my chore of 
being president at St. Mary's College, I was asked by the Diocese of Oakland to help in the new cathedral. And we asked Ken for help, and he said, well, you know, he finally did help, by the way. But I can remember when he, his first reaction was, well, you know, my interest is, is Catholic education. And so De La Salle, St. Mary's College, and the new school in, in, uh, out in Pleasant, and those are the things I want to contribute to. And well, you people can, you know, you can build your cathedral, and that's wonderful, but my real interest is education, and that's what I want to do. And he stuck to that very strongly until other people persuaded him to do something for the cathedral, which he did. Well, I can remember uh, several students coming here, going through St. Mary's College, because Ken Hoffman paid their tuition in one way or another. He uh, himself has taken on, in a sense, the mantle of De La Salle and the way he uh, proceeds to help younger people, those who are disadvantaged, which is really a very strong Lasallian factor in all of our schools. And so here comes 89 and we had tremendous talent. Uh, unbelievable uh, skills, you know, technical skills on the ball, and we had speed, um, and we invented the long throw-in by Dom Mazzari. Dom would on the sideline next to the other goal, and he would throw that ball so far into the box, we scored a few goals off of that, you know, from Dom. So, uh, so that's how we built it up, and in 89 I had uh, Tim Vest, I think. And so he was great, and his brother was a goalie uh, backup. So that was 89. And I took more students, more athletes in 89. We normally take 16 to 18. 22 guys in 89, half seniors, or 11 seniors on the team. Strong leadership, so it was great. The, the first thing they did at the beginning of the season was they came up with the goal. The goal was to win NCS. There was absolutely nothing to stop them from putting that goal in. Uh, and I think a lot of that had to do with Doug because he saw how we lost 87, so he kind of fulfilled that. Uh, you know, I could not work them any less if I wanted to. Because I'll give you an example. On a Wednesday during the season, it was raining so hard at the, at the school that I, you know, Doug came to see me, I said, what do you think? I said, I'm thinking of canceling practice. He said, no coach, I don't think we should. We don't want to get lazy. Why don't you just run us? I said, okay, where am I going to run you? So we ran the halls here at school. We'd go up uh, building one up the stairs, go down the hall, go down the stairs, come around, go to the next building. For 45 minutes, these guys were running like that. They were exhausted at the end of it. But that's the attitude. We don't want a day off work us hard, you know, and so that was great. And, you know, that was, so they were physically in shape. And that's, I think, the reason they were able to do the semifinal, double overtime, penalty, come back the very next day and do the same thing. Well, I think their legacy is the legacy of anyone who breaks the first ground into this. So they broke the ground, they took us to that level, and they won. And the fashion that they won set the stage for other teams. Uh, on the 89 team, there were two or three sophomores who led the 91 team to win NCS. And so then it started rolling. And so that we won it in 91, 93, 95, 96. And even in between some of those years, we were still in the finals and you know, lost, lost some of them. But uh, so really, the, the ones that lay the foundation, that was 89. And they did it in such great style as I mentioned, not a single score, goal was scored on them in league, and that's a legacy right there. Uh, and then in the NCS, we only got one goal, two, I think two goals against us uh, in NCS, so that was great. So that, their legacy is, I think, showed the future teams that the hard work and the talent that you got to the max brings results, and that's, you know, what they did.
They're, they're a special group of young men. Uh, they, when I came to De La Salle, I had a dream for them. Talked about trying to take it to a next level and uh, trying to win a state, state title. And uh, told them the plan, how we were gonna do that. And I think in the beginning, there's a little bit of resistance to it, uh, the work ethic that it would take to try to achieve our goals. But gradually, the kids bought in, you know, one by one. Uh, there were some lumps along the way, but everybody bought into it. And I was so happy for them because I've never seen a team come together so much. They truly were a band of brothers who really would do anything for each other. And to this day, they're still the best of friends. I remember, you know, A.J. Cool in particular. We played St. Joe's in the semifinals. And, and we won the game, and A.J. had a really poor shooting night. And uh, we won by about 16 or 17 points. And I went out to eat with my family, and I drove home that night, and I saw the gym door open, and I went in, and there's A.J. shooting threes. And I walked over and said to him, what are you doing? And uh, he, I said, go home, we won. And he said, but I'm never going to shoot like that again. I'm going to bounce back and make sure that doesn't happen again. And I think that was just sort of uh, representative of what all those kids felt. If they had a poor game, they went out and worked harder to make sure that that wasn't gonna get his feet. It was like Joe C. making the free throws. When he went to the line, that game was filled with emotion. We had the game, thought we lost the game, and uh, they had some fouls to give at the end, and it didn't look like we could possibly win that game. And then we get fouled with you know, two seconds to go, and I turned to Coach Sullivan and said, we just won a state championship, because I knew there was no way Joe would miss those free throws because I watched him every day shoot hundreds of free throws. And so that was the story of this team, preparation. Find out what we needed to do to get better and then each kid took it upon himself to do it. When you talk about character, I, I think that's been revealed in their adulthood. I love hearing from these guys. I hear from them quite a bit and, and the letters that they write and the emails that they send me are quite gratifying because they, they really are still state champions. They still get it and all of them are successful. All of them are still fighting a good fight. We used to always say to each other, fight the good fight. There's only a few of us left. And they still write that to me. They embrace that. And I really do feel like we, they're champions forever in everything they do. They're still winners. And I think all those roots were forged in that state championship run. Is if you look at that game, everyone, uh, five different guys scored, I think, at the end of the game. You know, there was never just one guy. It was truly a team effort. And, I, and that's what, when I watched that film, I hadn't watched it in a long time, but I watched it, I was just amazed how everybody shared the ball. Everyone was unselfish, making the extra shot. There was truly a sense of what's best for us. What do we need from Connor Mueller to making a three, a huge three, Charles Brown hit a floater in the lane, Joe C making free throws. It, it just, you know, all happened pretty, pretty, pretty special. It came together. When I watch those films now, I'm so impressed with how tough they were, mentally and physically. There were so many times in the course of the season where they could have folded, but they bounced back, uh, starting with that loss down in, down in L.A. They just always bounced back and always gave you a little bit more, and every time you thought we were done, they always had a reservoir. You'd, they'd look in each other's eyes and just draw it out of each other. You knew something special was going to come whenever they got together and huddled up. Uh, so it really was one of the greatest thrills of my life to watch them compete and how much they loved each other and really did it the right way. Let me tell you a little story about Mark Vieira. Mark Vieira was a skinny little kid he got to De La Salle, he wasn't the stud that he became. But as he started out, he was part of a very successful group of basketball players. Started out with his core group from Queen of All Saints. Mark was a stud. He could do anything he wanted on the basketball court. Nobody could stop him. And the proof of that was the success of the 1970-71 basketball season, our senior year. Mark could jump out of the gym. He could dribble the basketball. He could pass. He was an amazing talent. His success at the All-State basketball game where he was the leading scorer proved when he played with his peers, players that were going on to college careers and professional ranks, that he could hang with them. And Mark was one of the best that ever played in the Diablo Valley. Not many people remember Mark Vieira playing basketball at De La Salle because most of them are dead. <laughs> we go back, we go back to, a, to a simpler time back in the late 60s, early 70s when Mark Vieira was at his best. He may have been the best basketball player to ever come out of the Dablo Valley. And he started out as a skinny little kid from Concord 
and turned into a stud, the leading scorer in the All-State basketball game in 1971 at the Oakland Coliseum. Mark Vieira could do anything he wanted with a basketball. Run, shoot, pass, dribble. Unbelievable talent with a basketball. Mark Vieira played basketball every day of his life. From fourth grade through his graduation from high school, he was an incredible talent. Not to mention the fact that he was the number three state high jumper in the state finals his senior year. Mark Vieira could jump out of the gym. His talent on a basketball court was unparalleled. And I don't know if there was anybody ever that was better that came out of the Dabble Valley than Mark Vieira. And that's the truth. I can imagine our opponents that year in, in 82 watching our game film or our game tapes or, what, or scouting our games going back to their teams or back to their offenses and saying number 61 is going to be a fly in the ointment and uh, that's exactly what he was. He's small like a fly but you could never kill him. He was this guy that ruined everything and uh, you sometimes get defenders that on your defenses that just single-handedly can, dis can disrupt and destroy an offense. And he was one of those guys. Played him on the center, he had tremendous speed, tremendous strength for his size. You couldn't knock him off his feet. Nobody, can block, nobody could block him, he was so quick. And he had a huge, great nose for the football. He'd get there quick, find the ball. And he, he did just that, he disrupted offenses and he would he would uh, free up our linebackers, and when if you tried to double team him, he could still get around some of those. And but the best thing was, if they did, if they concentrated more blockers on him, it just freed up other guys to make tackles. He was critical to the success of that team. It's one of the best defenses we ever had. Patrick had a huge personality, and uh, I think the majority of the people really liked it. He was very positive and very upbeat and happy. He never had a down day. He was always kind of like a breath of fresh air, and uh, I enjoyed that. I thought that he'd come to, he'd bring a lot to practice when practice got to be uh, long and, and tedious. He was always there enjoying himself, making it kind of light and, and, and fun. He's a guy that brought fun to practice. Uh, sometimes he could take it a little bit too far, and that's when the, he annoyed a few people, and he annoyed me sometimes too, but. Uh, all in all, I'll take that little annoyance for what he gave. He gave our, our team gr a great spirit. Uh, he made football fun. And, you know, every team should have one. Every team should have a Patrick Oswald. He was not only a great player, he was, he was big in, in leadership and personality also. He's, a, he was, he's great to have on a team. So Pat getting Athlete of the Year when I was a freshman was um, – Pretty, pretty, pretty eye-opening. We're like, wh who is this guy? This is amazing. We watched him during football, and, and the guy just was, a, I mean, overachieved in every possible way and, and did so many great things as a, as a football player. Then he goes in and right into wrestling, and I don't know what his accolades were. I'm sure he's told me a hundred times, um, but amazing wrestler. And then rolls out onto the baseball field after wrestling, takes that team to a place that they, they, they had no business being at. They beat probably the best Northern California uh, individual team in Camp Lindo that, that's ever been put together. And so I just went through, amazing football player, unbelievable wrestle, wrestler, great hitter on the baseball field. I mean, how do, you not, how do you not see that he was athlete of the year? It's obvious that Patrick loves De La Salle and he, he came back and, and donated a lot of his time to uh, to uh, coaching after he got out of college and started his career in business. And he's always been a supporter. He's always been around. He's always been there encouraging our teams, holding the coach's feet to the fire that they don't slack off and, and uh, keeping us, pushing us, making us, uh, reminding us to work the kids hard. And uh, he's just a great competitor. And, 
He's a, a great supporter of what the school stands for and how we play football here and that we do it with class and dignity and, and pride. So he was everything. He got everything out of this school he was supposed to get out of. And uh, he pays it back. He has never forgotten us. He's never abandoned De La Salle. He's always, he'll be here. He'll be here for this school through the duration. To look back to Antonio's career and give one favorite moment, I was fortunate enough that back in the old days when I used to coach freshman baseball, I had Antonio as our catcher in freshman baseball. And then I, I coached him um, for a half year on JVs to when Coach Latticer asked me, you know, we need a running back who should come up. And automatically I said, Antonio, because it was real simple for me. Antonio was one of the most competitive athletes I've ever coached at De La Salle High School. That was, um, and I'm sure he was like to sit home as well, and I'm sure Alan will tell you the same thing. That guy liked to lose at nothing. Uh, you know, you could be playing probably Monopoly with him. I could see him, you know, you landing on your hotel and him tipping over the board in frustration. So Antonio just was unbelievable, and he had a fantastic work ethic. And the last word I would use to describe Antonio, I mean, he wasn't the biggest guy in the room, but he was one of the toughest athletes that ever go through this school. I mean, he reminded me of the guy on Monty Python where, you know, it's only a flesh wound. He would, you couldn't do anything to that kid. He would not come out of a game. You'd have to literally drag him off a field to come out. It was unbelievable, his competitive spirit. Jim, Jim Harbaugh from the San Francisco 49ers has a saying that he uses to describe some of his most determined athletes. He says he's as tough as a $2 steak. And uh, I think that quote or that description aptly describes Antonio. He's one of the toughest players, one of the toughest kids we've ever coached here at De La Salle. Um, he's the first back, I think, to rush for over 1,400 yards. He set a standard for our younger uh, athletes coming up from in the program to emulate, to follow. And he was the first one, and he built, he started a legacy, I think, that, that really reaches into how we play today. You know, um, it started with him, the way he ran, his determination. Uh, Antonio, his best asset, I think, was uh, uh, bouncing off tacklers, getting the hard yardage, the second efforts. And I think he gained probably most of his yardage after he was hit by the initial tackler. So he's the guy we look at as the first. And from there, it probably went to Russell Lawson and Greg Prawn. And then you have uh, so many great backs that, that come after him that were in his mold. And uh, Salim Mohammed, uh, Maurice Jones-Drew, Patrick Walsh, Lucas Dunn. De La Salle has a real rich tradition of runners here. And when I think of all the great runners we had at our school, and there's many more, Antonio was the first, and he, he's the one that set the standard. The kind of neat thing that I really like about Antonio, he's probably the first guy that would say, I don't belong in the Hall of Fame. What did I do? I didn't do anything special. And that's kind of like what makes him a Hall of Famer. I mean, he saw what he did as his job. He was supposed to do those good things. He was supposed to make those tough runs. And if he wasn't doing it, then he wasn't doing his job. So. His standard of excellence, it's kind of strange that, you know, he, it didn't seem like, he doesn't, it doesn't seem like he feels like he, he reached his potential. But whatever he did reach is a Hall of Fame quality. I remember about Doug Bryan is this, it's one of my favorite all-time football stories. And the year before, we had a soccer player as our kicker. And he had uh, some good skills as a soccer player, but unfortunately he had a girlfriend that he would fight with almost on a daily basis, before practice especially, and sometimes she would come out to the field and 
they would have to talk it out there. And the Coach Latterser was getting a little perturbed about that. So at the end of the year, and we're talking about next year, one of his rules he set down was no soccer players on the team. Find a kicker that's playing. I said, okay, no problem. Well, in the offseason, Doug came up to me and said, you know, that he was a soccer player, introduced himself. And as soon as he said soccer player, I went, uh-oh. <laughs> but he said, you know, his dad thought it'd be a good idea if he gave kicking a try to give him more options for college. And I said, well, you know, I'll let you come out during spring football and let's just see, you know, how you kick and we'll go from there. But I go, no promises. And I mentioned that we had some problems the year before and he even said, yeah, I know, but I'm, I'm not like that. I swear to God. And I was like, okay, no problem. So Doug came out for the first day of spring. We we're doing, you know, I was running, at that time I was coaching receivers and DBs, so I didn't have any time with them. But towards the end of practice, he had been warming up and I just told him, okay, put the ball on the tee. I go back up about like 10 yards and just run and kick it. Let me see, you know, what kind of leg strength you have. So he did that and he kicked the ball like 70 yards. And I went, okay, I think we can work with you. So I went to Coach Latticer and said, I know that, you know, you don't like, you know, the soccer player wasn't really working out last year. I go, but this is a really good kid, I think. And, I, and he's got a great leg. And Coach Ladd says, well, if you're fine with it, I'm fine with it. So Doug, you know, became our kicker. And... Um, it's awesome because, you know, he really got to show his skills on kickoffs and PATs because that's what he did most of the time. He, he just boomed balls in deep in the end zone. He showed that he had a great leg. We did try a couple of field goals. I know one time in the playoffs at DVC, I think it was the uh, Thanksgiving game, but we did try a 52-yarder with him, which is unheard of. It does how to let a kicker do it, but it was right before half, and he kicked it long enough. It was just right, so... We knew he had the talent, you know, as a kicker. And as it turned out, you know, just off his leg strength, um, at the time Santa Clara, I actually asked him to come to, to them. They offered him a little bit of money to go to Santa Clara, but his heart was set on going to Cal Berkeley. And we knew the Cal Berkeley special teams coach, and we said, you know, can you get him into school if he, if he wanted to walk on? And he thought that was a great idea. And so he did. He got him into Cal, and he walked on. And by his sophomore year, I remember one night I was watching uh, the old CNN sports report, and they said that Doug Breen had just kicked a 47-yarder to uh, beat Arizona. And I got real excited. And then the next week, he kicked a, a game winner against UCLA, my alma mater, but I didn't care. And um, he got a scholarship from uh, Berkeley, and his kicking career just flourished from there. And you know, made it to the NFL. And it's really a, a great story of uh, a soccer player <laughs> that just decided to put on football pads and made a career of it. So we're really proud of him. It's kind of funny to think of the success that he had as a junior and a senior. He made the varsity team as a sophomore at Dillisau. Ultimately went on to, you know, lead the team, co uh, team captain uh, senior year. But um, he was always a good athlete, and to play at the Division One level and obviously to have a 12-year career in the NFL, uh, you've got to be a really good athlete. But, you know, truth be told, I think what separated Doug from a lot of other people that were good athletes um, was work ethic and, and just a competitive spirit. I mean, to this day, he's one of the most competitive people that I've ever come across. And uh, as I look across people that, that have, you know, those type careers and that type of success, uh, athletically, um, that's typically what's what's you know in their DNA and what's driving them. I know, you know, he got it. It, it was in our family. He got it from my dad. Uh, but you know, I think I'm competitive, but he takes it to a whole new level. And really, um, it was something that he just had in him, even even at the high school level. He was part of a group that, uh, I think that year, there were 17 seniors on the varsity team, and, and they were all tight. And, and we always talk about brotherhood here, and, and that was one of the first groups that I was, had the opportunity to coach, that those guys all took care of each other. I mean, if some guy was not coming to practice on time, 17 guys would ride him. And uh, if one guy wasn't showing up to run off season, 17 guys are all over him, and Tom was kind of one of the you know, three or four main leaders of that crew. 
Um, and, and I remember all that group really well, but, but uh, he's one of the guys who's come back over the years and, and really tried to continue to make a positive influence on the school and the program. In water polo, he was the central figure. I mean, he's our, our center, you know, two meter guy. And uh, basically everything tried to flow around him. You know, he, uh, he got hammered by every other team's, you know, best player. And then typically because he was such a stellar athlete, they would drop two, three guys on him. And, uh, but we tried to run most of our offense through him. And uh, he had the rare ability to be able to play pretty much anywhere. I mean, we can play him outside, we can play him inside, but he was most dominant inside, so we used him there. Um, I think while Tom was a, a real good player here, I think he was second team, third team All-American, um, which is, is a huge accolade, but he went on to get better and better. Um, he went to UCSB and, and dominated there, you know, from his sophomore year on, um, and then played internationally, so on and so forth. But he, he's one of the few guys, I think, that are probably the one guy that I know, our first guy, to actually move on to that professional level and play in other countries and so on and so forth. And, and his skills improved dramatically after he got out of here. He's, you know, 100 times the player he is now than when he left here. So um, he really took his gift and, and made the most of it. Tommy was not a distance guy. He did not like chasing the black line all day long, but uh, he was more of a sprinter type guy, 50, 100. Um, and, and he was a get pumped quick, get out, get it done, and, and perform that way. So he did most of his damage in all the sprint areas and, and in the short relays. Um, as, as far as a competitor go, like I said, he was very relaxed and very easygoing prior to competitions. And in a swimming environment, that's good. You want to keep guys light so that when they get off the block, they fire up and go. Um, and he was great for that. As far as, you know, an all-around athlete and a name in the Dillasal Aquatic legacy and lineage, um, he ranks up there with, you know, very, very few of them. Um, we've had probably you know three four guys who've been able to cross over like that in the past and play not only you know here at a high level but go to college and then compete professionally i'd say maybe you know we've had three guys do that and tommy ranks up there with the best of them well tom is a teacher when he was in the water with the kids here i mean like i said he had 17 seniors on his, his graduating water polo team, which is ridiculous. I think we graduated all but three guys on the varsity squad that year. Um, and, and Tom had been there since the sophomore year, and, and he took it upon himself to be a teacher as, as well as a player. Um, and he's continued that you know, throughout his life. He, he went to Santa Barbara, again, kind of helped all the, the program develop. Um, and then has always made a point to try to come back here, help out when he can. Um, he went over to Justin, coached there, um, and uh, he's, always, he's always had a fondness for coming back and giving back to the kids to, to make the sport a little more widespread. Everybody's played basketball, and nobody's played water polo, so he tried to make a familiarity with that sport to kids new to it, and that, that, that was his goal.